Well, we're continuing our study of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. Before we get started this morning, I'd like to just to stop for a moment and go to God in prayer. Dear God, as we study this passage of scripture, we're going to see your great wisdom. I've come to the conclusion that I just don't have that. I see how you're able to constantly answer with just the right words. And I am impressed, dear Lord, with your abilities. And I want to say thank you for showing us that it's right to take a firm stand. And dear Lord, whenever we have trouble coming up with the right words, provide those words for us. Help us as we study this passage today. Use me as your vessel. Help me to rightly divide your word of truth. Open minds and hearts, for it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Or us in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, like we said there earlier, I've titled this morning's message, The Pharisees Strike Out. The Pharisees Strike Out. You'll understand as we go through the message this morning. You know, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he's hailed as Messiah and King. Remember, they placed their cloaks and palm branches on the ground. They, they strewed them out in front of him as his donkey is entering the city with him there on top. And then after examining the temple, he heads off over to Bethany. And he visits over there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then he returns to the temple and he cleanses it. And it's not a pretty sight. I mean, tables are being overturned, livestock's being chased out, along with all the vendors. Now, this was one of the very last straws for the religious elite. Jesus was messing with their income, as we learned last week, their cash cow, their golden goose, if you will. They've been looking for a way to get rid of him, literally to kill Jesus ever since that time. Jesus cuts them no slack. If you recall last week's message, Jesus told a parable that was directed right at the religious elite. Just laid it all out there. He called a spade a spade by using the parable of the vineyard. He pointed out the despicable actions that the religious elite were involved in right there in the temple of Almighty God. They not only tortured and killed God's prophets, they were preparing to kill the Son of God. Jesus knows. He knows that they are just biding their time. He knows that they want him dead. No ifs, ands, or buts. They want him dead. The next few days are going to be filled with a series of tense encounters between Jesus and these religious elite. The religious elite have decided to try and trap Jesus in his words. Now, we know that's a silly thing to do, but they thought they might be able to get her done. They're going to try and trap him with his own words. They're going to ask him some loaded questions. They know they're loaded questions. And that's where we pick up today's story. Jesus is facing off with a group of these religious elite folks. They're in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse number 13. If you open up your Bibles, or to Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse number 13, reading down through the first part of verse number 15, we read these words. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the word of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? You talk about a trap. They have laid a trap. And this is a big one. These Pharisees and Herodians, well, they're not stupid people. They thought this through and they know exactly what they're doing. They begin by buttering Jesus up. You know what I mean by buttering up? They're buttering Jesus up. We know you're a man of great integrity. They're buttering him up. You aren't swayed by man because you pay no attention to who they are. You teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You talk about buttering them up. They're laying it on thick. Jesus, you are all of this. Luke records their same statements of flattery. 
They're trying to catch Jesus off guard. That's what's going on. They're hoping that he'll say something without thinking it through. They know that flattery often works when they're dealing with normal everyday people. I mean, they're affected by flattery. So they know it works on them. Everyone likes hearing people say nice things about them. Ladies like to hear that their hair is pretty, that their makeup's nice, that their clothes is nice. Guys like to hear that they're strong and that they're successful and powerful, you know, all those kind of things. Flattery strokes people's ego. They figured Jesus was just like anyone else. If they stroked his ego enough, maybe, just maybe, he would let his guard down. If they flattered him enough, maybe he'd fall into their trap. Now, while we know what they said was true, in their minds, they were mocking Jesus, poking fun at him, kind of twisting the knife, if you will. They thought Jesus was an enemy to be brought down. Their flattery was nothing more than a tool to get them to their wicked goal of catching Jesus in their trap. A means to an end, if you will. That's what the flattery was. From their lips, these words were anything but true praise. They simply are baiting their proverbial trap. These guys, they want Jesus to say that the Jewish law denounces paying taxes to Rome. That's what they would like to have happen. But Jesus detected their trickery. He saw it for what it was. He knew their evil purpose the religious elite's question cut two different ways. And neither one was going to be good for Jesus. They thought they had him no matter which way he went. A trap that he couldn't get out of. If Jesus told them that those who were in the kingdom of God didn't have to pay taxes to Caesar, then Jesus would be considered an enemy of Rome. And that would not have been good for him. Because Rome did not put up with people who would stand in opposition to them. If he said that they needed to pay taxes to Rome, it would tick off his followers. The Jewish people detested being under Rome's thumb. They hated paying taxes to Rome. The Jewish people longed for the day that the Messiah would free them from Roman authority. In fact... Those who were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, as Jesus entered that town on a donkey, they were hoping that Jesus was indeed the Messiah who would free them from Roman oppression. Jesus wasn't about to walk into their baited trap. He knew exactly what was going on. He recognized their hypocrisy. And that brings us to Mark chapter 12. The second part of verse 15, down through verse number 17. Here's what those verses say. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a Daenerys and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. <laughs> Friends, Jesus was a master teacher. I wish I could always come up with just the right words to say. I don't always say just the right words. Sometimes I stick my foot in my mouth. I don't know if anybody else does that or not, but that happens to me from time to time. I love the way Jesus called them out. He called a spade a spade, if you will. He says, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. No ifs, ands, or buts. He just calls it like it is. And he's about to put these folks in their place. On this occasion, he even used an object lesson. We use those with kids a lot, don't we, to get their attention? An object lesson. He asked them for a denarius. Bring me a denarius. Bring me a coin. This was a coin that bore the likeness of Caesar on its surface, and Jesus knew it. <laughs> so did everybody else. The master teacher wanted to get his audience's attention, so he has them bring him a coin. And he asked them a very simple but very impactful question. I can just imagine Jesus holding up the denarius, holding it around for the whole crowd to see the 
the coin. And then asking, whose image, whose inscription is on this coin? Whose inscription is on this? It's hard to do holding a Bible. Whose inscription is on here? Well, the response is a given. Everyone knows, and in fact, everyone can see, it's Caesar's image that's on the denarius. There's no way for them to skirt the answer. They're going to have to say, it's Caesar's. The image of Caesar was right there in clear sight. Jesus uses their forced response to break free of their well-set trap. I love it. Once they acknowledge that it's Caesar's image on the coin, Jesus masterfully says, render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Wow. Jesus has slipped right out of their trap. It was baited, it was set, and he slipped right out of it. You ever had one of those tricky mice that did that? You put the, the peanut butter on there, the cheese on there, you wake up the next morning and the peanut butter and cheese is gone and the, the trap hasn't, hasn't done, the, done its job, hasn't caught the mouse? Well, that's the look they had on their face. How do you do that? I'm guessing they were standing there scratching their heads and wondering, how in the world did Jesus manage to wiggle out of that one? We thought we had him. We thought everything was in order. <laughs> Here's the thing. They didn't have things in order. The Pharisees had struck out, and thus the title for today's message, The Pharisees Struck Out. Jesus' answer was not anti-Rome, nor was it pro-Rome. He didn't go either way. He skirted things right down the middle. It was a simple statement of the obvious. If you owe Rome something, then go ahead and pay it. But in like manner, if you owe God something, then give it to God. Now, here's the thing, and I, I love this part. We're not told to give Caesar anything extra. Give him what he, he deserves. He doesn't say give him anything extra. Jesus' response acknowledges, but also limit what's owed to Caesar. Caesar can demand our money. After all, it's got his inscription on it. But if a tax hole or a tax loop is provided, I think it's perfectly okay to use it. Take advantage of those tax cuts. We do have a responsibility to provide a reasonable income for those who rule over us. Now, I admit, their idea of reasonable and our idea of reasonable may differ greatly. <laughs> it may differ greatly. I, I can't even imagine making what some of those guys in office make. But the fact is, God's using them, and they should be paid a reasonable amount. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 13. Go that way. I will never find Romans. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. It says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. And that's scary, especially underneath present-day circumstances. Who knows what's going to happen? I think God's planning to unfold things in ways that we cannot even imagine right now. It's scary. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God's instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong... Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what's right, and he'll commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. You get that point? In capital punishment, that, that's part of the responsibility of people in authority. He's God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. Man, I hate that. But it says it right there. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. 
If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt, the one that's never paid in full, the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you truly love your neighbor, you're not going to want to steal his wife. If you truly love your neighbor, you're not going to covet the things he has. If you truly love your neighbor, you're not going to want to murder him. Love is the fulfillment of the commandments. Friends, what we owe Caesar or Uncle Sam, as the case may be, pales in comparison to what we all owe God. Jesus shared a broad principle that's still relevant today. It's in complete harmony with Paul's teaching there in Romans 13. Jesus affirms, in principle, the basic legitimacy of human government. And yet he insists that one's obligation to God always outweighs one's obligation to those in political positions. Even American politicians may overreach sometimes. They may try to tax the working man into poverty. When governmental powers overreach, as America knows all too well, sometimes Boston Tea Parties may become a necessity. It's happened in the past. The thing we must never forget is that everything on this earth is temporal. It's only going to be here for a short time and then it's going to pass away. It's going to melt with fervent heat. The things of God are eternal. If you've got to choose between one or the other, give up the things of this world and cling to the things of God. As believers, we've been given the earnest deposit of the Holy Spirit, living in our hearts, securing a spot in heaven so long as we do not quench his leading. That means we owe God everything because he's offered and secured for us through the blood of Jesus, eternity with him. So while we render the minimum to Caesar, we must never forget that we owe absolutely everything to God in heaven. Here's the neat thing. Once we turn everything over to God, he gives it right back to us. Puts it right back in our lap and he tells us to go and to use all that he's blessed us with to make a kingdom difference. That's what we're supposed to be doing with the blessings of God. What kind of a kingdom difference are you making? How are you dispersing the resources that God's placed in your care? Some have more, some have less. He asks us to examine the resources we've been given and decide how we can best use them in the kingdom. Are you letting the message of Jesus ring forth from your life through your actions, through your words? If not, then we ask that you make a commitment this morning to do exactly that. Let Jesus' truth ring forth from you in a bold way. Won't you come as we sing this morning? Ring the bells. Sing.